Yes. Hello. Hello. There we are. We coming back. All right. Hey. What we got here? Hey, it's an order service for somebody. There you go, Amy. There's a brand new order of service for you. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Well, that, didn't they not do a great job? Man, y'all, it's not even 930. We Does anybody know the lyrics to that song? Dave was asked me, he says, what is that song singing about? You know what it's singing about? It's pretty cool. This is kind of hippie kind of generation stuff. It's singing about, let's build houses for the homeless. Let's put shoes on the children that don't have any shoes. Let's feed the hungry with nothing to eat. So all y'all that was out there judging going, what kind of evil music is this up in the church? <laughs> That's some daggum good music right there. Y'all go, y'all go watch that Jesus Revolution movie. Help you out. All right, so there's three, really three reasons, though, I asked them to do that song. Number one is it comes from one of the greatest eras in music history, in my opinion. <laughs> two, it fits the time theme that we're talking about this weekend. And three, it's in the genre that's going to sort of help some special guests I got coming next service. This weekend was my 40th high school reunion, class of 83. Goose Creek High School, yes. And so last night we had like this cocktail party, right? There was something Friday night, something last night. There was a picnic after church. So they handed out superlatives last night. So who's got the most children? Who's been married the longest? Who traveled the furthest to get here? Who's got the coolest job? All that. I got a superlative. Most changed. Yeah, baby. Thank you. Thank you. I'll rock that all day long. So when I was thinking about that, I was just curious. I was like, okay, this was my 40th high school reunion, which blows my mind. So then I thought, hey, why don't we poll the audience? How many of y'all out here this morning, if your high school reunion was this year, it would be between 40 and 60 years? Stand up if you're 40 to 60 years. For, look at that. Wow, 40 to 60 years. All right, there we go. I like it. I like it. All right, how many of you, if your high school reunion was this year, would be between 10 and 40 years? Between 10 and 40, stand up. Okay, okay. Heavy over here. Look at this. We got a whole 10 to 40 section right there. And up in the balcony. That's awesome. All right, now let's see. I know how big this demographic is going to be at next service. I'm curious at this service. How many of you, if we had your high school reunion this year, would be less than 10 years? Less than 10 years. Stand up. Okay. Okay. All right. Representing. I like that. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Cool. Okay. That's awesome. All right. So we've had a lot of fun. We're getting started with the message. I need y'all's help because we need to kind of get ourselves oriented to what today's message is about. So I need you to finish these statements for me. Super easy. All right. You ready? Oh, man. You ready? Boom. There are 60 seconds in one. There are 60 minutes in one. There are 24 hours in one. There are seven days in one. There are 365 days in one. Bam. All of y'all passed school. Thank you. Thank you. No, none of y'all in here got that common core curriculum. Y'all are all on it. You actually learned something. All right, so trick question, science question. What celestial body, okay, for those of you who don't know what the heck I'm talking about and you think I'm being lewd, that's planets and stars out in outer space, okay? What celestial body gives us our frame of reference for being able to tell time? The sun! Dang, y'all are smart. Yeah, right? Because of the sun, we know that we make one revolution every 24 hours on our own axis, right? We're spinning, spinning every day, once every day. And then we know that we make a full rotation, one big lap all the way around the sun every year. That's how we know the seasons, right? We, and it's not perfectly symmetrical. We kind of drift out here because we're into the fall, and then we get way far out because now it's winter and we're the furthest away. But then we start coming in a little bit closer because it's spring, and then we get where we are right now, which is dang if we ain't close to the sun, and it's summer, and it's hot, right? So again, it's the circles. Every day of our life, it's just circles in our days, circles in our year. And it's because of that that I got the inspiration for the title for today's message, which I decided to call The Circle of Life. And so what the circle of life...
Wow. Hey, Eddie. Hey, okay. We're, oh. Hey, um, are you surprised? Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah, Mary. <laughs> Very surprised, yeah. Did you like it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, you that's, it. A, that's a lot right there. That's a lot. Well, Eddie, when we heard what you were talking about, we know that you love to make your message come alive with some dramatic effects. And so we thought this was pretty dramatic, huh? This is very dramatic. Yes. Yes, very. Very. Well, aren't we so excited to hear the rest of his message? Well, thank you, guys. Yeah, y'all give him a big hand. Thank y'all so much. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, for the dramatic element. That is just so cool right there. Love you guys. Y'all are amazing. That was so thoughtful. That is not the circle of life that I was talking about. I'm not talking about the eat or be eaten. You know, hey, you eat the grass and then you get eaten by the lion. And, you know, no, no, no. That, that wrong, 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 wrong circle. Okay? Let me dial you back in. Let's dial back into what we were talking about, right? We make an axis, a rotation on our axis every 24 hours. We make a lap around the sun every year. And I don't know about you, but I am very visual. And so I thought it would help you to give you a visual of time from our perspective, using the sun as a reference. So if we do that, we have this one big white line right here that would represent one year moving around the sun. Okay, so that is a year, and that is our rotation around the sun. Then on top of that, we would have all these little circles that represent one single rotation every 24 hours, right? Now, there's only one problem. That is not to scale, obviously, because how many of those little circles do we need? 365, so let's scale it, bam, there you go. So that is time from our perspective to scale. 365 times we rotate on the Earth's axis as we make a full lap around the sun. So everybody tracking with me so far? That visual makes sense? Good. Here's the thing. That's our perspective with the sun as our reference. When you step out of the earth and get into space and you start to accelerate, time begins to stretch out on a plane to the point to where if you could accelerate, if you could, to the speed of light, time would stand still. We have any Star Trek fans, Star Wars fans? Okay, yeah. So you've seen the movie, right? What happens when they punch it, when they jump to warp speed or hyperspeed, what happens to the light immediately? You see it stretch out in front of them. That's pretty daggone accurate. Because now they're outside of the earth and the rotation, and they've stepped outside of our time, and now you start getting as close as we possibly can to the eternal. And that's kind of where I'm going with all this, but I can tell y'all are thinking and you're crunching really hard. So let me give you a little bit more of a visual to help you. Okay, can I get some mood lighting? Let me set some mood lighting right there. There we go. There's some mood lighting. Okay, and let's all give our, atten our attention to the screen because here's the deal. If we could hop on a ray of light and travel at the speed of light in 1.25 seconds, we'd see the moon. Seven and a half minutes later, boom, we're going past the sun. In 14 hours, we'd have to button up our coats because now we're moving past Pluto. And we know just how cold it is out where Pluto is. A hundred thousand years later, we're leaving the Milky Way. Everybody wave bye to the Milky Way. In 1,500,000 years, we arrive at Andromeda, the closest galaxy to ours. Make a U-turn, zip it right back to, to the earth, bam, and we arrive back. Now, if it took us a million and a half years to get out there, how long did it take us to get back? A million and a half years. So we've been gone for what? Three million years. Except that's three million years on earth. You are only about one day older. Yeah, I'm going to let that sit. Because what just happened was little color wheels all across it's your processors, they're, they're, like, they're crunching right now. Every bit of hard drive, RAM, ROM you got is just crunching. We've honestly only been gone for a day, so you come home and you, 
you go to where you used to live, and there's like this weird-looking structure. It doesn't even look like a house. And you're like, hey, my name's Dave Ammons. Like, this, where, where's my family? They go, Am- there haven't many Ammons lived here in millions of years. Three million years at the speed of light. That is the closest, by our imagination, that you and I can get to touching eternity. And what's my point to where I'm going with this? I'm trying to help us begin to see things through God's perspective of time. And then to help us put it all together, kind of frame it up all together. So what would happen if you and I could actually experience eternity? Like if we could actually go experience eternity in heaven with God and then come back to right now, how would that affect you? Well, it just so happened that that did happen to a man named Paul. Paul, if you don't know, wrote a lot of the books in the New Testament, and he gives this account of what happened to him one day. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. You know why he's saying that? The same reason you're trying to wrap your head around it right now. He just thought he wasn't here, and then he was there. And he's seeing incredible things, and and he doesn't know how long, and then boom, he was back. He's like, I don't, I don't, I, I, did I leave and go there? Did I, did did my body stay here? But my, what, like, what happened? That's literally why he puts it in there twice. He says, but I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. Now, let me tell you what effect that had on Paul. It made him an animal. It made him a gospel-sharing machine. Something about his perspective changed, and when he came back, it was Katie bar the door. I mean, you couldn't stop him. Don't take my words for it. Let's read what he says in 2 Corinthians. I know I sound like a madman. See, I told you all that. That's Paul's words. I have worked harder been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to even keep me warm. Anybody's list just got a lot smaller of your complaints? I was complaining a couple of days ago about physical therapy for my shoulder. I'm not complaining right now. I mean, can you imagine that's his actual account? Those are the things that actually happened to him. Why did they give him 39 lashes? Because 40 is considered a death sentence. I mean, just one whipping of 39 probably would sink most of us. But you could not stop Paul. Something about that stepping into eternity and seeing this world from that perspective changed his life forever. To the point to where none of that discouraged you. I mean, what would you give? What would you give? Let's let's read in Philippians and get an even clearer picture of his perspective. This is what he says. For to me, living on this earth means living for Christ and dying, stepping into eternity, even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better if I continue to live. How many of you would love to have that kind of outlook on life? That no matter what happens to you, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough it gets, no matter how big the loss, no matter how how great the adversity, you're like, I ain't moving. 
not moving. My faith is not shaking. Man, not only is it not shaking, I'm diving in even more. You start, let me tell you what happens when you start tithing. When you start tithing, the enemy comes and goes, oh yeah, I'm going to break that. I'm going to break this. I'm going to break that. But if you know that you know that you know that that's what God's told you to do, you say, man, you know what I'm going to do, devil? I'm going to give even more. How about that? How about that? And then the word says, resist the devil and he will flee. That breaking stuff ain't going to last for long because the spirit of God is going to step in. He said, I'm going to rebuke that guy. All you got to do is resist him. So that kind of perspective and tenacity. Now, the only problem is I can't snap my fingers and carry us all to eternity so that we can have the experience that Paul did and then bring us back so that we can say, oh, I get it. I see it. But what I think I can do is I think that I can get us close. How about if I try to get us close? All right. So we just saw time from our perspective. The sun is our reference, okay? Now we're going to look at the same exact time from God's perspective, okay? So if we look at time from God's perspective, the reference for him would be his word, Because his word is eternal. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ was the word made flesh. So with that being a frame of reference, now our big white circle. Nope, nope, get rid of the little ones. Just the big white one. That big white circle right there. That now, from God's perspective, represents all of time. Start at the top. Genesis chapter 1. Make a full lap all the way around Revelation 22. All of time, right there. Now, on top of that all of time would be every generation that's ever existed. So pop those little circles back up there again. Those are our 365 little circles. Anybody recognize a problem with the scale? Can't be 365, right? Because that's every generation that has ever existed or ever will exist in all of time. Now... I can't do that math, so I'm just going to have to fall back on what we used in the beginning, which was we were gone for a day, and that was 3 million years. So let's just take that. Let's, if there were such a thing as an eternal day, okay, which we can't accurately measure, but using the speed of light, we know that if we traveled out and back in a day, it would be 3 million years here. So using that as a reference, then those circles would represent 3 million years but we don't need three million circles because we need all the generations. We're going we're gonna to shrink it down to generational. Actually make it bigger, right? Because three million would be a lot smaller. So let's just for this math sake make 100 years a generation. I get that it's typically 85, but just for the sake of math, we're going to do 100. So in three million years, what is three million divided by 100? Busting out the phone. 30,000. So that means there would be 30,000 generations that would have existed from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. So let's put that to scale. Bam. And bam. There we go. Ah, boom. There you go. So there you go. So you see them? You see the circles? You don't see it? Can you all like highlight one, like put a square around one? There you go. See it? You can see it right there. See it? Got it? Okay. Give me an arrow. There we go. See it? Right? Got it? Blow it up. Oh, there it is. There it is. One generation. One generation. Now, does it make sense when we look at time from God's perspective and we read in the Bible where David talked about how, you know, our life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Or when Peter talked about, he said, hey, our light and momentary trials and sorrows that we have here, are just, they're, just, they're just like a mist in the wind. It's like a flower that, that springs up and blooms and then it's gone. I know it feels like it's a long time. I know it feels like it's forever. But it is not compared to the glorious eternity that God has for us. Peter and Paul spent a lot of time together. Now, Peter didn't have any kind of heaven experience, but you know Paul downloaded it to him. And it helped Peter because Peter was speaking to people that were under absolute tremendous, horrendous persecution. He said, guys, just hang in there because at the end of the day, that's 
the amount of time we're experiencing right. It's kind of like when you have kids. You ever have your kids when they're little and you say, okay, I need to start teaching you about chores and responsibilities. So you say to them, okay, this is what I want you to do. Okay, I want you to start cleaning your room and I'm going to let you know when you can stop. They go off. In your mind, you know you're going to give it 15 minutes and you're going to tell them they can take a break. But they don't know. They don't know how long it's going to be. About a minute and a half in. Oh, much longer. How, I've been doing this forever. Minute and a half. Now, you know, I mean, they're, you, know, you know what they're doing. You know it's just wearing them out. But you know it's going to be 15 minutes. It's, it's going to be this. It's not that long. But for them, because they don't know, and they don't know how long, for them, it really does feel like an eternity. For them, it really does feel like, oh, my gosh, I, just, I, can't, I can't do it much longer. I'm hungry. I need some water. Right? It's the same thing for us. We don't know. And so when we don't know and we don't have this perspective, our perspective is still the 24 hours, 365, 24 hours, 365, 24 hours, 365. Now, here's the cool thing about wrapping your mind around God's perspective on time is if we could learn to see the gospel through God's perspective, it makes all of these verses sound so much different. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. When you see it from this perspective, you realize when Christ stepped into, Christ had this same perspective of all of time. He saw the whole thing. He saw all of humanity, all the generations that ever have and ever will exist. He saw that they were all separated, and he said to his father, I will go and give my life for them. And he did. It's this perspective that helps us understand how in the world a man named Isaiah in the Old Testament could accurately describe an event that was going to happen 800 years later. How? Because God's Holy Spirit has inspired every word in the Bible. So by God's Holy Spirit, Isaiah is writing, and the Holy Spirit comes and says, Isaiah, I want you to describe this event. And he doesn't understand it. He, does, he doesn't understand why, but he writes it. And he says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that... Uh, The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 800 years before Christ arrives on the scene. It makes sense from this perspective when you read, Christ suffered for our sins once For all time, he never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he is raised to life in the Spirit once for all time. God's perspective. And then I love these words of Jesus. This is Jesus himself praying. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. He's praying for everyone for all time. All right, Eddie, so like, how does that affect me today? I kind of see it. I kind of get it. I still got the little spinny wheel a little bit. But I see what you're saying. You're, you're talking about seeing everything from God's perspective instead of mine. Um, MT, can you pop back up here real quick? Let me borrow you. I'm going to use MT as an example. So MT is a handsome young man. And MT is sitting in service today, and he hears this message, and he's like, that is the most phenomenal gospel message I've ever heard in my life. And he says, because of that message, I'm going to decide today that I'm going to give my life 
to the Lord. And so he does. He has this, what I like to call a sober moment. And a sober moment being that all of a sudden, by the same Holy Spirit that inspired Isaiah, now the Holy Spirit comes on MT. And while I'm up here fumbling through a message and trying my best to make it make sense, the Holy Spirit is saying to MT, God is real. And Christ is his son. And he loves you. And he desires to be with you. And so because of that, now MT responds. And MT has this conversation with God. He comes to God and he says, God, I believe in you. I believe in Jesus and I need you in my life. My life is not working. And, and, and I admit, I've been doing it all on my own, my way. So I need you to come into my life. And, and God is just lovingly looking down on MT. Then MT says this, forgive me of my sin. Now catch this. When MT says, forgive me of my sin, how old are you, MT? 24. I got saved one year after you. Well, no, you didn't get saved when you were 24. You got saved when you were little. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. So, but he's not saved. He's a heathen. He's about to get saved. <laughs> so his frame of reference for saying, God, will you forgive me, is these 24 years of his life. Do you know what's next year, year after? You know what you're going to do? Like you have any idea what sins you're going to commit? No? Okay, here's the deal. When he says, would you forgive me of my sin? God now is looking at MT, and he doesn't see MT in this time. He sees that MT, that dot MT. He sees MT from the moment God knit him together in his mother's womb till the day he'll take his last breath. He sees every sin that MT has committed up to this point, but every one that he ever will because he is going to 100%. We all are. And then God says to MT, I forgive you. Every sin. Every sin. And so now MT walks away and he feels lighter. He feels something has happened. He can't quite describe it, but there's a weight that was on him. And, and now it's lifted and somehow he maybe can't describe it, but it just feels good. It's almost like God's way of just touching him and letting him know, I've got you. You're mine now. And then MT goes home and MT goes to sleep. And then MT wakes up tomorrow and he goes to work and just has a really bad day. A really bad day. Like his boss just rides the fire out of him. I mean, just absolutely just giving him the worst day of his life. And, he, and, and those old feelings that he had before he asked Christ, to, they start bubbling up. And his reaction to that anxiety, to that frustration is, I'm going to go hit the liquor. And he jumps in there and he goes home and he just binges. Shot after shot after shot after shot, and then he passes out. And then the next morning he wakes up. How do you think he feels? Not about the hangover. About God. Now he feels ashamed. Now he feels, oh my gosh, what did I do? And so here's the difference, okay? If MT's frame of reference is our time, 24 hours, 365 days a year, then his mindset is going to be, I have to come to God and once again beg him to forgive me. I have to come to God once again and say, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I can't believe that I did that. And he's going to enter into this kind of mode of begging and pleading with God. And, and he's not going to know if God's forgiven or not because that was pretty bad. I mean, I went from zero to 60 on the sin meter. I absolutely messed up. I don't even know if I really got saved because how could I do that if I really got saved and now this stretches on for days and days and he feels horrible and people that saw him right after church said man you look so good but now when they run into him they're like man are you all right you don't like you why aren't you making eye contact with is, it, is everything okay are you doing but he's just feeling so bad on the inside and days and days until maybe he finally has a breakthrough here's the difference MT wakes up the next morning and he gets this perspective of God's eternity and how God sees time and how God says, I forgive you. I forgive all of your sin. Now he comes to God and he says, God, I'm so sorry. I, I know you've already forgiven me. You told me that you forgive me. I just needed to come and tell you, I'm sorry. Just help me do better. And immediately he feels light again. Immediately he's aware of, I'm walking in God's forgiveness. I'm walking in God's forgiveness every single day of my life. When I accepted Christ, God opened up this bank account, this bottomless bank account full of God's grace, and I can write as many checks as I have to. 
Amen? Amen. Thank you, MT. It's that eternal perspective that changes you. I love, um, I gave this, this same illustration to the students at Cathedral Academy. And when I got done with that, I, they were sitting there kind of stunned looks on their faces trying to wrap their heads around it. I said, now talk back to me. What did that just do on the inside of you? And one of those students stood up and he said, man, that just took a lot of pressure off. Like, I didn't realize that. Like, God has seen every single day of my life. Like, yeah, that's a little dot, but he cares so much about that little dot that he's numbered every single hair on my head, and he knows the plans that he has for me. And, and you know what? Even when I'm experiencing bad stuff, I might have to go through some bad stuff. As a matter of fact, if I read the Bible accurately, I will go through some bad stuff, but it's, it's so short. It's so quick. And then it's done, and we're with God forever, and we never have to worry about this again. So, yeah, I just... It took the pressure off. I feel lighter. We've got a gentleman in our congregation, Bobby Brunson. And Bobby Brunson did have that experience in the 70s, late 70s. He was struck by lightning, was dead for over 25 minutes, clinically dead. No breathing, no heartbeat. They're doing CPR on him. The ambulance gets there. They're doing CPR on him. They're trying to bring him back. It's not working. Finally, after it was either 27 or 28 minutes, they quit. They gave up. The paramedics step out of the ambulance, and they walk around to the front to tell his wife, Kay, He's gone. We tried everything we could. He's gone. Meanwhile, Bobby was in heaven. He meets all these people that had died before him. His father, all these people that were from his church, he recognized them, but they didn't look like they did the last time he saw them because the last time he saw them, they were all old. Now they were all like in their prime. They were like in the most prime age that they could possibly be, but he still knew it was them, and he's having all these conversations, and then Jesus comes up to him, and said, Bobby, you can't stay. You're not supposed to be here right now. you got to go back. And so when them paramedics are up front telling Kay he's gone, there's nothing we can do, Bobby comes back into his body and his heart starts back up on its own. And so you know what happens when you go to Bobby now and you say, man, Bobby, I'm struggling, man. This is going, he's like, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the, you know what the small stuff is? Finances job, career, drama, the world, the chaos. That's the small stuff. You know what the big stuff is? It's people. It's relationships. He said, because Eddie, I've been there. And the biggest thing you realize when you come back is you want everybody you know to be there with you. I've been there. I know what it's like. It's unbel- it, is so, it is so unbelievable that when he came back, he was clinically depressed for a year because he didn't want to be back here. He said, Eddie, this world is disgusting. It's dirty. It's nasty. It is so far removed from what we experience in eternity. He said, that place, the grass and the sky and the people, it's amazing. He said, I just want every single person that I meet to be there with me. So what does that lightning of the load represent? Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. Jesus gave us an example, and I said this last week. Jesus, in order to accomplish his God-given mission on this earth, needed people, friends, and relationships. Jesus gets it, and Jesus gets us. Watch this commercial. He didn't go to college. I never asked for a raise. He didn't wear fancy shoes. I never took out a mortgage. His friends didn't belong to a country club, and his parents didn't have a will. So he worked hard and invested wisely, not in stocks or bonds, but in others. Such a good commercial. 
So my challenge to you this week is the same challenge I gave you last week. And let me just, let me just commend you because after last week's service, I've had several people come up to me and say, man, somebody just walked up to me and said, hey, Eddie said I need to be more intentional about getting some people in a relationship, so I'm here to talk to you. That really is what we need to do. My challenge to you is how can you just let the things of this world, everything, the news, all, how can you just get that to fade away and get your eyes focused on the main thing? And the main thing is people because this world is hurting and they need the Jesus that is in you. So I'm going to do something right now. First, I'm going to say, if you're in here and you're a small group leader, would you go ahead and exit and make your way outside? And I'll tell you guys about that in just a minute. But while they're going, I want to make sure we give anybody an opportunity to take that first step with God. If you haven't, I'm going to make it very easy. Like what I was talking about with MT, you just had that moment and you realize, man, you know what? I get that now. I thought that turning my life over to God meant that I was entering into some sort of contract and now there was this new set of rules and regulations and now my life was measured off of how well I do and how many boxes I can check off and how good I can be. Now I see that that's not it at all. God sent His Son into this world to save the whole world. He died once for all time, all generations to give us the peace of his presence, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He came to walk with me through this world. And so when I mess up, it's not about the rules and the regulations. It's just about saying, God, I need your grace. I just need your grace. So if you're in here and you have never done that, you've never given your heart to God, I just want you to register that real quick. And I want us to pray a prayer. We're all going to pray this prayer together. But if you've never done that, then this is going to be your prayer, and this is going to be your day, and this is going to be the moment when God supernaturally steps into your life. So let me give you just a moment to register that if that's you. I'm not going to have you raise your hand. We're not even going to close our eyes. I just want you to register, is God speaking to you today? And if he is, as we pray this prayer, you pray it with every ounce of faith that you've got. And if you've only got enough faith that is like less than that speck that was on that white circle, God says that's more than enough. So if you would, everybody in this room, just repeat after me. Father God, I believe in Jesus. He was your son. He came and died on that cross for my sins and the sins of the world. And I believe that all I have to do is invite you into my life. And I am forgiven of my sins because of my faith in Jesus that he died for me and he rose again. And I do believe that. And I confess that. I am a sinner and I need you. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's just give a hand clap for anybody who did make that decision. We're so glad that you did. So a couple of ways, a couple of next steps for you I talked about last week. One is growth track. That is probably the easiest. It's the shortest commitment. It's like, okay, that's just four weeks. I think I could do that. But what's going to happen is if you give those four weeks, I'm going to promise you it's going to launch you, and you're not going to want to turn back. Growth track happens every Sunday in the chapel at 1030 in the morning, but it doesn't happen at 1030 this morning. Why? Because a lot of our growth track leaders are also small group leaders. So as you exit out the doors, out in front of the church, you probably saw it coming in. We've got all All of our small group leaders out there waiting to talk to you. All of our groups that are listed on the website, they're represented out there. We'd love for you to go out there, have a conversation, talk with them, chat with them. They would love to give you, there's no obligation, it's just for you to find out, hey, tell me what your group is about. What is it that you guys do? They would love to have that conversation with you. Stand up with me if you would, please. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning. Thank you for being an awesome congregation. Thank you for pressing in to God. You are just phenomenal. We get so many wonderful, wonderful stories about you every single week because of your faithfulness and your kindness and your gentleness and your love. So I bless you with that awareness that your life is not about 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It is not. 
your life is about an incredible plan that God has pieced together for this entire universe. And that little piece is a little piece of the puzzle that you occupy. And it is so valuable that God gave his son, the life of his son, for you, each one of you, individually. And I bless you with the ability to walk out of those doors light, free, forgiven with the light and the life of Jesus in your eyes so that you can go out there and love on a world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.